Our film begins in Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In spite of the island's remote location, it has also fallen victim to the epidemic of the 21st century, plastic. Plastic pollution is littering beaches and endangering certain species of animals, no matter how remote or out of reach. In this laboratory in the north of the archipelago, scientists study marine animals, not plastic, at least in theory. No idea what that is, <laughs> but it's certainly plastic. Jessica Perelman is a biologist. Accustomed to finding plastic in fish stomachs, she has started a very unique collection. Occasionally we'll find plastic bags, and this was all coiled up in the stomach when I found it. And I had no idea what it was until I unfolded it and just... How did you react when you find this in the stomach? I was shocked. I started, you know, documenting it and measuring it, taking photos, showing whoever else was around in the lab, and we were kind of, we were just, you know, shocked to think that, that these fish are, are really ingesting this. I mean... To her disbelief, the scientist has found plastic in an unlikely specimen known as the lancet fish. The young researcher was not expecting such a surprising discovery when she began her work on this species. These fish live at a depth of about 200 to 1400 meters, uh, and they're clearly you know, coming in contact with plastic, and it appears that plastic is, is truly a deeper problem than we might have imagined. Even swimming at these depths, the lancet fish manages to swallow trivial plastic objects. I mean, occasionally you might find a, a brand name such as this Dasani bo bottle label. Um, what is this? So this is, this is a label from a water bottle, a Dasani bottle, clearly, and um, found amongst the lancet fish stomach. Is it a famous brand, Dasani? Dasani, yeah. Dasani is a pretty well-known uh, bottled water company. You know, finding, finding labels such as this in the stomachs makes it then easy to determine where it, you know, where it may have originated. There's always more to things than just what you see. And Dasani is much more than just water in a bottle. In fact, Dasani is one of the world's best-selling bottled water brands. And if you're not familiar with Dasani, you will certainly know the name of the group behind it, the Coca-Cola Company. Everyone knows Coca-Cola, but not everyone necessarily knows that the group is in charge of dozens of other brands. Dasani is part of the Coca-Cola Company and Sprite too. There is also Minute Maid, Powerade, and of course, Fanta, one of the company's flagship brands. Every year, the group sells more than 120 billion bottles across the globe. That's almost 4,000 bottles a second, and this mass production is creating a devastating mass pollution. In January 2018, the multinational made a bold announcement. By 2030, the brand is promising a world without waste. And it's James Quincy, Coca-Cola's CEO, who is leading the movement. What we need to create is the circular economy. We need to create value for that. It's absolutely doable. A world without waste, thanks to unlimited plastic recycling. 
But how reliable are the promises of this multinational? Can recycling really make this problem go away? With plastic becoming a global catastrophe, we investigated the company's promises and uncovered a secret strategy which contradicts their convincing pledges. On a l'impression vous jouez double jeu. C'est pas un double jeu si ça ne reflète pas notre politique aujourd'hui. For decades, the multinational has been aware of the damage that its plastic bottles are capable of causing, but responsibility has never appeared to fall on them. What is the reason behind this? Because ultimately it means it means higher costs for them. In Africa, far from the soda giant's American headquarters, we are going to expose the truth behind the so-called recycling economy that Coke is trying to promote. Come on, one last drink for the road. Welcome to the wonderful world of the plastic promises of the Coca-Cola company. Coca-Cola and plastic have a long-standing relationship, and one that is full of surprises. To find out more, we traveled to the United States to meet a man who is well informed on the subject. He lives in this small house in Virginia. Hi, guys. Hello, Bart. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes. Sandrine. Welcome to uh, Virginia. Coming Thank down you. All it's difficult way. to find. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I hope, uh, I hope the drive was good. Yeah, well, come great. on in, come on in. Thanks. Yeah. Bart Elmore is a historian. He's the author of a book about Coca-Cola. A bestseller, it retraces the multinational's entire environmental strategy, particularly from the 60s onwards, when plastic began to revolutionize consumer society. We began to see massive amounts of litter piling up around the, uh, the country. Coca-Cola tried to respond to this. Wow, we're getting blamed for all this aluminum waste and all this ultimately plastic waste. What do we do? And one of the things they did was partner with an organization called Keep America Beautiful. When you hear Keep America Beautiful, you think like, wow, this sounds like an organization started by a bunch of kind of bearded environmentalists, or at least that's what I thought. Um, you know, because you see this sign everywhere in the United States. It's still a very present organization. But it was founded, surprisingly, by the beverage, brewing, and canning and packaging industries. Right? The idea was that, let's tell consumers, they're the bad ones, they're the litter bugs, they're throwing this away. Industry shouldn't be blamed for all of this waste. And so this Native American, looking like a character from an old Western, makes the Keep America Beautiful a huge success. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And this guy throws, uh, in his car, he throws this packaging waste down at his feet. And then and this great cameraman you know, lifts the camera up towards the, the crying Indian's face, and there's a tear. And this narrator comes on the screen and says, People start pollution. People can stop it. People start pollution. People can stop it. Right? And it's this message of consumers are the problem, right? Not us industry, but consumers are. Since the success of this advert in the US in the 70s, Keep America Beautiful has branched out. Now there are organizations throughout the world designed using the exact same model and always backed by the company with the red and white logo. To understand how Coca-Cola is recycling its reliable old consumer guilt technique, we have to go to Versailles, not to the chateau, but to an event that is being held at the town hall.
It is an important conference with several elected officials from all over Europe. They're here to speak about the cleanliness of their towns, and it's serious stuff. They're even discussing the colour of their trash cans. To conclude the meeting, the guest of honour makes a speech. This time, it's the director of Keep Scotland Beautiful, an association partly financed by Coca-Cola, like Keep America Beautiful. And it seems Derek Robertson is a fan of soda. Listen closely. Some of his slip-ups are extremely telling. I have the great privilege of working for an organisation in Scotland and also in part of the European one that gives a, gives a, 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 a shit, I was going to say, but doesn't care. We do care and we want to try and change the behaviour of individuals. We want people to start thinking about civic pride, the personal responsibilities that they should take. Emphasising individual rather than collective responsibility, clearly nothing has changed since the advertisement of the Native American crime. I've seen that you, you were drinking Coca-Cola this morning. Is a single-use bottle plastic a, a problem today? Plastic and plastic packaging has a very useful function in society, and we need to we need to remember that the products are very creative, they are very very useful, and they obviously perform a function that's important. It's how we, again, as individuals, dispose of these packages. So, uh, Coca-Cola, for example, want their packaging back. They want to be able to get it back and recycle it and reuse it. Uh, what we don't want is uh, in the environment. According to the head of an association which claims to fight against pollution, Coca-Cola is supposedly the example to follow. But does he admit to being financed by the American multinational? We asked the question a few minutes later. Uh, who is financing your um, charity? Nobody finances a charity. Nobody finances your charity? What, what do you want to do here? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm asking you, these are legitimate journalist questions. Right, so my, my organisation in Scotland is my day job, OK? I'm fundamentally full-time committed to that role. I volunteer my time, OK? <laughs> By asking the finance question, we have identified a touchy subject, the conflict of interests. You, you spoke of conflict of interest. Do you think there is a conflict of interest? No, I didn't. I said you think you were trying to create an issue about a conflict of interest there. That's what I think you were trying to do there. Do you think there is one? No. Who your sponsors are? I don't have sponsors. Again, that's a, it's a different model. And I'm not about to start explaining I mean, how charities... Is it, is it that a secret or...? No, you can go, you only look at accounts if you want to see, see what it says. We don't have sponsors. And I work in partnership with the Scottish okay. Government, with Scottish municipalities, and they hire our experts. And some companies? And some companies, yeah. Like? How long would you want? Loads of them. Coca-Cola, H&M, McDonald's, Wrigley's, Starbucks. Lots of, lots of big brand names. We had to insist. Since the 60s, Coca-Cola has been paving the way for other multinationals. But what if the soda giant really had decided to change? A few months ago, upon launching its programme for a world without waste, the company announced a set of very ambitious measures to resolve the plastic pollution problem. For Coca-Cola, the solution is recycling. The concept is simple. Collect used bottles to make new ones out of them. Coca-Cola promises to put 50% recycled plastic in its bottles by 2030, and that's on a global scale. It's absolutely doable. There's a model there for the Chinas and other parts of the world on how to create value out of plastic and get it reused. Of course, that would be great news. But with all that we have learned about the company's strategies, we wanted to check how often they actually keep their promises. The American company has been promising to make bottles out of recycled plastic for years. Take the year 2008, for example. In its report on sustainable development, Coca-Cola announced that it wanted to put 25% recycled plastic in all of its bottles by 2015.
For a long time, we sought to find any trace of this in the report from 2015. The company never clearly states whether or not their promise was kept. We end up finding a single figure, 12.4%. At first glance, it's easy to believe that this is the percentage of recycled plastic used by Coca-Cola. But after taking a closer look, 12.4% turns out to be the total percentage of recycled and renewable materials used. The problem is that recycled and renewable plastic are two very different things. To decrypt the soda giant's jargon, we arranged a meeting with an NGO that has been interested in the Coca-Cola group for a long time. Hélène Bourges is a specialist in ocean pollution, and she's going to explain how the multinational twists words and statistics. Le plastique que Coca appelle renouvelable, c'est du plastique qui est produit à partir de végétaux, comme par exemple le maïs, amidon de maïs. Et d'ailleurs, le nom qu'ils ont trouvé, c'est plantes bottle avec un petit logo vert, une petite feuille. Mais quel que soit le type de plastique, malheureusement, l'impact est, est le même. Renewable plastic is essentially plastic made from a plant base, but it's still plastic and therefore it's still bad for the environment. That clears up the words, now let's move on to the statistics. Et donc, ça ne veut pas dire 12,4% de plastique recyclé Non, ça ne veut pas dire ça et on a un, un document en fait, euh, des traces écrites de, de Coca qui nous explique euh, dans un échange de mails que en fait, c'est uniquement 7% de plastique recyclé contenu en moyenne dans les bouteilles au niveau mondial. Et sachant que l'objectif en 2015 était 25%. We are clearly very far from the target. From the NGO's point of view, Coca-Cola's recycling targets are first and foremost a marketing ploy to ensure that the consumer keeps buying their plastic bottles. Ces entreprises là qui utilisent énormément de plastique, euh, elles trouvent dans le recyclage la solution qu'elles peuvent vendre à l'opinion publique. Mais le problème, c'est que le recyclage, c'est pas toute la solution. Là, on a atteint un niveau de production de plastique qui est tel euh, que le recyclage permettra pas de, de tout, tout reprendre et tout transformer et recréer 100%. Ça n'existe pas. Coca-Cola's subtle statistical distortions are bad, but the worst is yet to come. We uncovered something far worse in this envelope, which contains dozens of letters and internal records from Coca-Cola. These documents should have remained confidential, but they were published anonymously on the internet a few months ago. We carefully sifted through all the information and found that we could not be further from their ambitious A World Without Waste slogan. Amidst the mass of information, this document caught our attention it's dated from 2016 and signed by the Coca-Cola's lobbying manager in Brussels. The bullet points are all the measures that Europe could adopt, but which do not coincide with Coca-Cola's interests. In the mix, we find carbon pricing, restrictions on the usage of caffeine, and EU ban of advertising to children under 12. In other words, anything that could lower the company's turnover figure. On the right, there's a circle entitled Fight Back. These are all the European measures that Coca-Cola has decided to fight against through lobbying. And amongst the measures that Coca-Cola downright refuses, we find increased collection and recycling targets. You heard it. Coca-Cola wants to fight against increased recycling targets in Europe, while they're promising the exact opposite in their public pledges. C'est d'un cynisme redoutable. Leur travail, c'est de maximiser leurs leur bénéfices, donc ils travaillent dans ce sens-là. C'est leur boulot. In the fight back category, we also discovered that the company wants to fight against the deposit system. 
This is one of the systems that is actually effective in combating pollution, and the oldest in the game are well aware of this. The deposit system works like this. When you buy your drink, you pay, let's say, a euro for it, and you also pay an extra charge, the deposit, let's say 20 cents per bottle. In total, it'd cost you one euro 20, but if you bring back the bottle, you'd get your 20 cents back. And so, all of a sudden, no one wants to throw their bottles away anymore. And what is most ironic is that the returnable bottle is virtually how Coca-Cola began. In the 50s, a bottle of Coke was not always served by a pin-up girl. Instead, it was served in a glass bottle with a deposit. So, once empty, the bottles would go back to the factory where they would be washed and reused. This creates significantly less waste for the environment. The system worked very well, but Coke decided to put an end to it and use plastic instead, completely disregarding one particular scientist's recommendations. Would you like to know how Coke decided to get rid of the returnable bottle? The company has forever attempted to keep this story from getting out, but we tracked down the only man able to tell it. Today, he is enjoying a discreet retirement in Michigan, in the United States. Hello. Morning. I'm Tom Green, the go. Good to meet you. Nice to meet mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much for welcoming us. Mm -hmm. Please enter. Thank you. Thank you very much. This gentleman is called Arsen Dane. He worked for the American Environmental Agency for many years. He's also the first engineer in the world to investigate the ecological impact of Coca-Cola bottles. Well, that's a fair imitation, but they were smaller. Yeah. A typical Coke bottle was about this, this big, green, translucent, and always glass. Always glass. Arsene Dane is referring to the beginning of the 70s, that was when the Coca-Cola company began to show an interest in plastic and to reach out to him. What they wanted to know is if you take into account in all other environmental impacts on nature, what is the best system? The engineer works for over a year comparing the environmental impact of glass bottles to that of aluminium cans and plastic bottles. He cross-analyzes the data, makes graphs, does complex calculations, and he finally comes to this conclusion. A glance at the table shows that the returnable glass bottle, provided it makes 15 trips before it is discarded, is the ecological container par excellence. Thanks to this report, the Coca-Cola company knows fully well at the start of the 70s that returnable glass pollutes significantly less than plastic. But the company would never publicly share this information. We put this together for them, and uh, they didn't publish it. You know why? They were not interested in, in have, having the public see the, the the total picture. Why? Because they wanted to keep, in, keep it quiet as to which way they were going to go. This is the new lightweight plastic two-litre bottle. I watched them slowly introducing the plastic bottles. Easy goer. For your Coca-Cola bottler. In fact, one time I even remember clearly one time going, to, uh, going home and saying to Bridget, my wife, uh, I said, ah, they're going to the plastic bottle. I told you they would, and they are now going. It's just the first step. So light that 10 easy go plastic bottles weigh less than one glass bottle. Easy go weighs 25% less than fast. With this advert for its new plastic bottle released in 1975, Coca-Cola buries Arsene Darnay's report once and for all. It's light, it's tough, it's easy goer. The American company never looks back. Coca-Cola imposes its plastic bottle everywhere, and theirs isn't the only one flooding the market. It's a tidal wave. 
From the 80s onwards, plastic devastates beaches. And the first ecologists begin to protest against pollution. Certain American states consider a forced return of the deposit. Little do they know the company's immense power. Coca-Cola has been a, a, a significant force behind fighting legislation that would put deposits on containers or put some kind of price on packaging waste. There are newsletters that talk about all the successes that Coca-Cola is having around the country. And it's almost like this great you know, celebration letter every, every week. We defeated this deposit system in this state and we defeated it here. Why do you think uh, they were fighting so hard against deposit system? What is the reason behind this? Because ultimately it means, it means higher costs for them. In, in the end, this was a way of, this was forcing them to internalize their pollution costs. This was a market mechanism that's very smart to try and get industry to recognize that you have to deal with this waste. Let's recap. In front of the cameras, Coca-Cola's CEO promises us a world without waste. That's our objective. But behind the scenes, the American company is doing everything in its power to eschew any alternatives to plastic, like the returnable bottle. Allez, after months of negotiations with the American multinational, we have a meeting at the headquarters of Coca-Cola France for an interview. Bonjour. Alexandre. Merci de nous recevoir. Oui, bienvenue. On est ravi d'être ici. A polite and warm welcome. On n'a pas bougé le mobilier, mais tout est amovible. Est-ce que vous voulez boire quelque chose? But it seems we have not yet won their trust. On va filmer le, nos échanges. Bonjour. Bonjour. Comme on vous l'avait dit par, par oui. email. D'accord. Donc c'est Archie qui s'en chargera. The vice president of the company, Michael Goldsman, has traveled from the United States to answer our questions. Bonjour. He has worked for Coca-Cola for 21 years. He's in charge of global policy and environmental sustainability. Bonjour. And he's a French speaker. Merci infiniment. Vous êtes venu d'Atlanta exprès pour nous? Euh, oui. Ah, d'accord. Vous êtes là pour quelques jours à Paris. Oui. So our interview bon, bon. is done in French. Coca-Cola a, a lancé un programme pour un monde sans déchets en 2030. Est-ce que vous pensez que c'est possible d'arriver à un monde sans déchets avec 4000 bouteilles en plastique vendues chaque seconde par le groupe Coca-Cola Oui, on pense absolument que c'est possible. On se sent vraiment responsable de ce qui se passe. Donc, ce qu'on veut faire, c'est qu'on veut entraîner, créer une économie circulaire. Donc, nos emballages ont de la valeur, peuvent être réutilisés. Et si nous et d'autres industriels utilisent encore plus de matières recyclées pour refabriquer les bouteilles, ça va entraîner une économie circulaire. Quel est le pourcentage de plastique recyclé que Coca-Cola met dans ses bouteilles à l'échelle mondiale aujourd'hui D'accord. À l'échelle mondiale, on a du travail à faire. On est à 7 Dès 2008, le groupe Coca-Cola s'était engagé je pense, et vous allez me le confirmer, à intégrer 25 de plastique recyclé en 2015. Donc là, on est en 2018, on est toujours très très loin du compte. Vous le dites vous-même, dans le monde, euh, la proportion de plastique recyclé dans une bouteille, c'est 7 euh, Comment ça se fait Pourquoi vous n'y êtes pas arrivé Parce que euh, c'était difficile, et vous avez raison, on n'a pas atteint nos objectifs. On est conscient, on sait qu'on a de, de la marge pour améliorer notre performance. Mais avec cette nouvelle stratégie, on compte y arriver. Mais on est d'accord, vous êtes quand même loin du point d'arrivée. Je suis d'accord qu'on est loin. Mais euh, on a lancé euh, cette stratégie en janvier, donc on est en juillet aujourd'hui. Donc Coca-Cola s'engage dans une vraie politique, en tout cas c'est ce que vous dites, depuis janvier 2018, c'est-à-dire depuis un peu plus de six mois. On a été impliqué dans les systèmes de collecte et de recyclage dans plein de pays. On a investi en France en 2012, donc ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est nouveau pour nous, mais oui, notre stratégie, notre nouvelle stratégie a été lancée en janvier 2018. Est-ce que vous connaissez ce document Oui. 
Alors, il date de 2016. Ce document, il est signé Sofia Crisopoulou, pardon, c'est votre lobbyiste à Bruxelles. Et ce qui est très intéressant, c'est que en haut à droite, ici, donc, il y a un cercle que vous appelez « fight back ». En français, « fight back », ça veut dire « contre-attaquer ». Parmi ces mesures, on lit quelque chose qui est très intéressant, « increased recycling and collection targets », en français, l'augmentation des objectifs de collecte et de recyclage. Expliquez-moi. Ce document ne reflète pas notre stratégie aujourd'hui. C'est un document C'est un, un vieux document, comme vous Il avez dit, ans. qui date de 2016. Il n'est pas vieux, il a et, deux ans. Ben, notre nouvelle stratégie a été lancée en janvier et ce document ne reflète pas cette stratégie et ne, ne, re, ne reflète pas la, la politique aujourd'hui. Attendez, euh, M. Goldsman, vous m'avez dit il y a quelques minutes seulement, nous, la préoccupation du plastique, du recyclage, etc., c'est quelque chose qu'on a depuis longtemps. 2016, votre lobbyiste en chef à Bruxelles, face à l'Europe, dit très clairement que parmi les mesures à contre-attaquer, il y a l'augmentation des objectifs de collecte et de recyclage. Je vous ai dit que ce document ne représente pas notre politique aujourd'hui. C'est ça qui est important. C'est ce qu'on veut faire aujourd'hui. Ah, attendez, il y a deux ans. Il y a deux ans, vous étiez contre l'augmentation des objectifs de Mais est-ce qu'on va collègue... parler de ce qui s'est passé il y a deux ans ou est-ce qu'on va parler de ce qu'on entend faire et on est en train de faire aujourd'hui pour créer un système Mais qui comment... va qui va aider à collecter, réutiliser, travailler avec d'autres partenaires, d'assurer qu'on qu crée une économie Pardonnez-moi, mais on a l'impression que vous jouez double jeu, très clairement. Parce que d'un côté, vous vous engagez pour une politique de recyclage dès 2008, donc bien avant 2016, et de l'autre, vos lobbyistes à Bruxelles se battent contre l'augmentation des objectifs de collecte et de recyclage en Europe. Ce document ne représente pas notre politique aujourd'hui. J'ai compris, j'ai compris. Mais, mais vous ne me répondez pas sur ce double jeu. Ce n'est pas un double jeu si ça ne reflète pas notre politique aujourd'hui. Juste une question. Euh, Sophia Crisopoulou, elle est toujours votre lobbyiste à Bruxelles Oui. Ça veut dire qu'elle a refait son graphique, alors c'est plus le même aujourd'hui Oui, ce n'est pas le même. Mais vous pouvez nous donner le nouveau graphique je, je, non, je n'ai pas un graphique à vous donner. Toujours euh, dans ce graphique, je suis désolée, hein, mais il est quand même important ce graphique euh, parce que c'est un document interne à Coca-Cola. Dans la catégorie des mesures à combattre, il y a le terme « EU Scheme for Deposit Systems ». En français, ça veut dire euh, un système de consignes. À l'époque, on ne soutenait pas les systèmes de consignes, euh, mais aujourd'hui, on, on est prêt à les soutenir et justement, on participe dans plus de 40 systèmes. Donc là encore, vous avez changé d'avis. On a changé d'avis. D'accord. En deux ans, vous avez changé radicalement. C'est-à-dire que là, vous disiez, il faut contre-attaquer en 2016. Et là, en 2018, vous dites, on est pour. Ça a été quoi, le déclic On est en communication avec des tierces parties tout le temps. On a des dialogues tout le temps. Et on réévalue régulièrement nos politiques. Et on a décidé que c'est le moment de, de vraiment investir... Et on a travaillé sur le terrain, on a des actions qui démontrent qu'on euh, est sincère, on, on est convaincu qu'on peut le faire. D'un côté, vous me dites oui, on était sincère, mais on n'a pas réussi. Et puis voilà, et puis de l'autre côté, il y a ça. Et donc, il y a votre stratégie, elle aurait dû rester secrète hein, d'ailleurs. Donc, euh, votre sincérité, si vous voulez, j'ai des doutes. On dirait qu'elle est à géométrie vous, variable. Vous, vous, vous avez le droit d'avoir des doutes, mais je, demande, je vous demande et je demande à, à votre public de regarder nos actions dès maintenant de ce qu'on va faire et, et ils peuvent juger si on est sincère ou pas. Before judging their actions, let's take a little trip. Unforgettable Tanzania. We travel to Tanzania, a country in East Africa, known for its incredible landscapes, unspoiled beaches, and the best safaris in Africa. However, what this promotional film does not specify is that Tanzania is also the incredible land of Coca-Cola. Here, everyone waits for red and white buses, walks alongside red and white walls, and in the playgrounds, children play around red and white. The logo is everywhere, so after a while, you almost stop noticing it. 
The good news is that in this country, you can still find Coke bottles made out of reusable glass, but this will all soon be over. The American company is doing in Tanzania what it did in the United States 50 years ago, replacing the glass bottles with plastic ones. That's what is going on behind these walls, inside one of the four Coca-Cola factories in Tanzania. Our guide is James Malaba, the manager of the new production line, a production line which only makes plastic bottles. Today, they're producing bottles of Fanta, one of the numerous brands inside the Coca-Cola group. Everything is automated and the equipment is brand new. The bottles are filled behind this window. Counter for Fanta Pineapple. And how many? It is uh, 86,340 bottles, which is, is the land of two hours and the, uh, two hours and a half. 86,340 bottles in two and a half hours. That's a lot of plastic. We did the calculations. That's 10 bottles a second. And that's only on one production line in one of the factories in the country. Five years ago, this factory only fabricated glass bottles. But on the day of our visit, the production line for glass bottles is almost at a complete standstill. People, they want to take as a takeaway. Apart from plastic uh, allergy B, where you have to do like uh, a butter trade. Apart from that one, even you look in terms of aesthetics, eh? In terms of aesthetic, it looks good. <laughs> the aesthetic, perhaps, but the choice of plastic is essentially a money issue. For glass bottles, they have to take care of the return of the uh, glass. But for me, I don't care about the return. I'm only care is it consumed. <laughs> What our guide is trying to say is that plastic doesn't seem to be a problem for the environment in Tanzania. So it's come like a business. You see, everyone now uh, takes as a business perspective, so he collects all those plastic. That's why I say 80% has been recycled. Now that our factory visit is finished, we can finally show you the wonders of the unforgettable Tanzania. Unforgettable Tanzania. Here are the real results of Coca-Cola's famous recycling business. And just by looking at the waste collectors we were told about, it's clear that the recycling business is first and foremost a poverty economy. Mata is 50 years old and has three children that she is raising by herself. To feed her family, she collects plastic on the beach. What is the best? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the best, like Coca-Cola, yeah. yeah. Evidently, Dasani is also leaving its mark in Tanzania. By working eight hours a day, Mata can collect up to 20 kilos of bottles. At 250 shillings a kilo, that's 10 cents. She earns less than two euros, and that's on a good day. Uh, 
nimesema ni hii pamoja na hii. Eh lakini anasema una unavopata yeah. majito sherehe. Hii sipati ya kujitosheleza isipokuwa na kim mahitaji yangu yale lazima okay. tu. Lakini sio kazi ya permanent kwamba inanitoshereza. Hmm. Bado iko chini. Kwa hiyo 200? 280. Eh nani kiviwanda vyote sio kiwanda kimoja. Oh, okay. Why the price is down? Mm-hmm. Inashuka kwa sababu chupa zinakuwa nyingi kiwanda. Uh... Mm-hmm. Too much plastic and too many people like Mata who collect empty bottles just to scrape by. witness to the most unsustainable side of this savage recycling economy we head to the largest tip in the land dar es salaam the economic capital of the country every time a truck arrives to unload waste it's the same frenzy And so they resort to using their bare hands to dig through other people's waste. Hii challenge unazipata humu kujikata na chupa, kujichoma na masindano. Kuna madude mengine yanaingia humu kama haya mavampaya si manini. Haya maulojo. Sisi yote yanatuasili. At age 30, Mwaramu has already spent two years rifling through waste in search of plastic. That's more than enough to know that there is only one rule to the recycling business here. Only the strongest make it. Tunaongea ukweli tumeshachoka. Tumechoka kama hivi tunaumia lakini hatuonee huruma. Atuelewe atuambiwe. Mmoja kipima basi ndio wewe na sisi tunafuata huko huko. It's time to clean the windscreen and head elsewhere. We go to meet the people who dictate the law on the new market for recycled plastic. We find them in the suburbs of Dar es Salaam. These are the companies who buy plastic bottles. This one is the largest in the country. Before coming here, we never would have imagined filming anything quite like this. A mountain of empty plastic bottles that you have to climb with 70 kilograms on your head. At first, we are almost fascinated by this blue mountain and the incessant coming and going of climbers, all smaller than their loads. But then we talk to the workers. At the foot of the mountain, these workers begin their final sorting session. They put the colored bottles and plastic bags to one side. They put the clear bottles into large bags. These bottles then go through these machines to be reduced to small pieces before they can be recycled. Mm. 
Until very recently, the company exported this plastic to China, the largest buyer of recycled plastic in the world. This is what the site manager is about to explain to us. Yesterday when I was working and asking the collectors to tell me about, they told me the price went down a few months ago. Yeah, they went down Why? because China denied to buy this one. We stopped for a while since September and we start on February to export because there was no, no, no market. So what did you do when you couldn't export to China? Oh, we keep on buying. We buy and we buy and we buy. You see that mountain? <laughs> This is because you couldn't sell to China? Yeah. So it accumulates? Yes. In 2017, China announced that it no longer wanted to be the world's largest rubbish bin and that they would stop importing used plastic from January 2018. This decision led to the collapse of the recycled plastic market, a precarious business and an economy that rests entirely on the backs of the most vulnerable. Back at the Coca-Cola headquarters, we speak to Michael Goldsman, the vice president of the company, again. Je voudrais vous montrer quelques images d'un pays où on a tourné dernièrement. Alors, je vais vous montrer ces images-là. C'est la Tanzanie. Vous êtes déjà allé en Tanzanie? Oui. Donc vous y êtes allé pour le groupe Coca-Cola Oui. Qu'est-ce que vous y avez fait Qu'est-ce que vous y avez vu Ces images plaisent à personne. Et ne, on n'est pas content de ce qu'on voit là non plus. Mais c'est justement la raison pour laquelle on lance cette nouvelle stratégie. Vous savez pourquoi on est allé tourner en Tanzanie Non. Ben, je vais vous l'expliquer. Parce qu'il y a six ans, Coca-Cola ne vendait en Tanzanie aucune bouteille en plastique. Que des bouteilles en verre, elles étaient consignées. Et aujourd'hui, les usines d'embouteillage de Coca-Cola en Tanzanie misent, mais alors très clairement, sur le plastique. Pourquoi avoir fait ce choix Le consommateur, euh, il y a, comme, comme je vous ai déjà dit, il y, a, il y a des avantages et des inconvénients pour tous les emballages. Le consommateur cherche aussi la, la portabilité du, du boisson. Donc si vous êtes passé du verre au plastique en Tanzanie, c'est de la faute du consommateur Non, c'était notre choix pour répondre aux demandes du consommateur, mais ça veut dire qu'on a aussi la responsabilité de mettre en place des systèmes, ce qu'on compte faire maintenant aujourd'hui, pour assurer la collecte de ces bouteilles. Mais vous êtes passé du, du verre au plastique il y a six ans, pourquoi vous ne l'avez pas mis en place à ce moment-là, ce système de collecte de, du plastique Ce qui compte, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, on, on est en train de le faire. Bah non, ce qui compte aussi, c'est que pendant six ans, vous ne l'avez pas fait. Vous êtes passé du verre au plastique sans prendre en compte tout le système de collecte et de recyclage qu'il fallait mettre en place. Aujourd'hui, on a une nouvelle stratégie et une nouvelle politique. On, on, on veut entraîner et créer cette économie circulaire. Vous parlez d'économie circulaire. Euh, économie circulaire, hein, en gros, c'est le business du recyclage. Euh, moi, j'avais envie de vous faire écouter quelques témoignages pour vous montrer à quoi ressemble ce business du recyclage en Tanzanie. Regardez. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez on pense que nos emballages ont une valeur après avoir utilisé. Et si on investit à tirer la demande en utilisant plus de matières recyclées, ce n'est pas une question qui a trop de plastique, il n'y a pas assez de demande. Donc si nous, on, on tire la demande en utilisant plus de ces bouteilles en tant que matière recyclée, ça va aider, ça va créer une, cette économie. Mais attendez, ces, ces gens vont se battre là pour récupérer des bouteilles, pour en tirer quelques centimes. C'est plus de l'économie circulaire, c'est l'économie de la misère. Ça, comme je vous ai dit, il faut mettre en place un système, une infrastructure où ces personnes vont avoir un vrai salaire pour pouvoir travailler dans le ramassage et la collecte euh, des, des, des emballages. Moi, je ne comprends toujours pas pourquoi, quand vous êtes passé du verre au plastique en Tanzanie, vous n'avez pas mis en place l'économie du recyclage, parce que l'économie du recyclage, aujourd'hui, en Tanzanie, ça ressemble à ça. Un commentaire Mon commentaire, c'est qu'ils ont besoin de plus de financement pour créer un système, mais on voit 
Mais on voit aussi que ce qui est collecté, ce sont des bouteilles en PET, parce que ça a de la valeur et ça peut être réutilisé. Qu'est-ce que vous avez regardé sur ces images Les bouteilles en plastique ou les hommes qui les portaient j'ai regardé entièrement ce que vous m'avez montré. Ce qui est frappant, c'est surtout qu'ils ont des montagnes de plastique sur le dos et qu'on voit que cette industrie du recyclage en Tanzanie, elle n'est pas du tout mise en place. Ils ont des montagnes de, 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 de plastique, mais ce que nous, on, on veut dire, c'est que c'est une ressource. Parce que pour vous, en fait, ces images, c'est de la ressource. Notre bouteille peut avoir une valeur. Toutes les bouteilles en PET peuvent avoir une valeur après leur vie, euh, leur première vie. Quand vous voyez ces images, est-ce que vous ne vous dites pas « Nous, Coca-Cola, on a fait une erreur en Tanzanie ?» Je n'aime pas voir les images. Personne n'aime voir ces images. On sait qu'il y a une préoccupation de, sur le plastique et on met en place aujourd'hui un système pour y répondre. Est-ce que vous pouvez me dire, en Tanzanie, ce que vous avez mis en place concrètement C'est-à-dire, qu'est-ce que vous avez investi Qu'est-ce que vous voulez développer pour que, effectivement, on ne voit plus ces images Je ne je, je peux pas... On n'a pas encore euh, lancé ce projet, mais on, on a des plans. pour l'instant, vous n'avez rien investi On n'a pas investi aujourd'hui. On est en train de, de monter le modèle en Tanzanie en utilisant ce qu'on avait fait en Afrique du Sud. Mais il faut, il faut revenir dans un an et on va voir ce qu'on a mis en place sur le terrain. Hmm. Donc dans un an, il y aura quoi en Tanzanie on va, on va mettre en place le même genre de système. Donc il y aura une usine, il y aura... Dites-moi ce qu'il y aura. Il y a des systèmes de collecte et après il y a des systèmes de conversion, de reconvertir en matière recyclée qui peut être utilisée. Coca-Cola vante un monde sans déchets, c'est, c'est le discours de votre PDG, M. Quincy. Euh, est-ce qu'un monde sans plastique, d'après vous, c'est possible Nous, on ne voit pas un monde sans plastique. On, on, on voit les avantages du plastique, euh, le, la portabilité, l'impact carbone, euh, mais on sait qu'il y a des effets néfastes et donc c'est pour ça qu'il faut mettre en place le système pour le gérer correctement. With Coca-Cola, you can still taste the feeling in plastic bottles. Zero waste does not mean zero plastic and the promise of a circular economy is very far away. To conclude our investigation, a single statistic will suffice. During the length of this film, nearly 13 million bottles of plastic will have been sold by the Coca-Cola Group throughout the world. 